the Age of Uncertainty podcast by Nigel Baker. Licence revoked. Some work on how to be a secret change agent. Hello again and welcome to the latest episode of the Age of Uncertainty podcast. I'm just recording this just before I do a presentation to the Heart of England Scrum User Group. Now by Heart of England they of course mean Birmingham, I would call it more the centre of England myself, but that's because in my heart I'm a West Country lad. <laughs> this presentation is on Licence Revoked, a short quick look at the world of secret change agency. I'll go into more detail about why it's a short and not fully comprehensive look during the talk itself, but I hope you enjoy it. Anyway, I've got to get ready now, it's a few minutes before we start. <laughs> Take care, thank you. See you soon. Let's get this thing going. So welcome to the presentation, Licensed Revoked. Some work on how to become a secret um, change agent. Okay. Now, uh, before we go any further on this thing, um, just a little bit about me, if you don't know who I am. Uh, my name's Nigel Baker. Uh, I started off, I've been in IT for 25 years now, pretty much. Been into Agile for around 17 uh, been an agile coach for about 15 years and that's mainly what this presentation is about it's about the coaching side of things um, but I've been like a certified trainer for 13 years presenting at conferences uh, for about 11 years I've even done some keynotes nice and more most importantly for this video I have looked like a Bond villain for the last seven or so years right so I have got the um what was it let me just give it The entire Doctor Evil thing going quite nicely. I like to think so myself. Um, and so, welcome to Licensed Revoked. Now, here's the first thing about this presentation. This isn't, uh, well, it, this is not a presentation, okay? This is a presentation on a presentation, if that makes sense. What I mean by that is, uh, about a, 18 months ago, a year ago, the Scrum Alliance announced they were having their US gathering in New York. Now, I love New York. I've been once in my life. I had a great time there. And I thought it was going to be fantastic to go to New York. Myself, uh, Jeff Watts, who's on this call, uh, Paul Gard, a few of us got together and said, we'll all get together. We'll have a great time. You know, we'll, 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 we'll see the sights of New York. We'll go to some piano bars. We will just generally have a great experience, right? Uh, now, you may not know this, but these things aren't cheap, these conferences. You know, the flights are expensive, but it's like a thousand, you a thousand, I think it's more than a thousand dollars to actually get into this New York gathering. That's not cheap. Now, if you get a presentation accepted, you get to go free. They even pay for a couple of your nights. So what did I do like most normal human beings do? I thought I'll come up with a presentation to get me into the gathering, right? Um, the presentation, interestingly, was on a viral change. And then, embarrassingly, viral change happened. And it's been cancelled. Uh, how annoying, right? Uh, at this current moment, I'm negotiating with an airline that are trying to give me vouchers for my, my plane tickets rather than uh, give my money back. So let's see how that goes. So I was really, really disappointed in that. Now... Oh, by the way, a little bit of advice before we go any further. So I've been to about 21 gatherings all, right, all over the world. And I've actually spoken, I just worked it out today, I've spoken at 15 of those gatherings. Right? 15 out of 21. That's quite a good hit rate. So if you want some advice on just how to get something submitted to a conference, first things first, have a good subject. Right? Have something that would interest people. Something that adds value to the attendees' lives. Right? Number two is have some sort of hook, right? Because it could be valuable to the attendees, but they may not know it yet. So you need some sort of hook to sort of lure those attendees in. So when I was developing up my presentation, the original thought I had was Englishman in New York. You know, the song by Sting, by the police? Englishman in New York. It doesn't go like that, but something like that. And um, so I thought, oh, brilliant, I'll do an Englishman in New York pastiche or something. It'll be brilliant. I'm English. It's New York. Brilliant. Except then you get into things like Quentin Crisp, who lived there, who was the Englishman in New York. And that's a really hard hook to hang a presentation on. And then I was actually reading a book about James Bond and found a story called 007 in New York. 
So I thought, ooh, that can be my hook. You know, that 007 in New York, this will be what I'll do. This will be the clever little bit of um, magic that will get people interested in the presentation, right? Um, I thought I could dress up as Blofeld, get one of those jackets, shave the chin, maybe get a, um, a white cat puppet, maybe? Yes, Mr. Barnes, I understand. Something like that for a bit of fun with the presentation. Um, why do that? Well, it makes it fun and entertaining, uh, but it's also, if your presentation ever gets into a bit of trouble, you've got a bit of show business you can fall back on. So I had the idea that if I was going to talk about viral change and it all went horribly wrong, at least I could do five minutes messing around with a white cat and me doing a bit of a um, stand-up to make it less painful. And the third thing about submitting to gatherings is you need a catchy pitch. The user is not the customer, right? So the fact is with these gatherings is the attendees do not select the pitches. There's a group in the Scrum Alliance, a volunteer community, a volunteer committee that reviews the submissions for entry. OK, and sometimes that's done quite rigorously. Like They take your names off of it sometimes. They sort of limit so you can't just say, do, don't you know who I am? So you've got to make sure that not only do you have a hook, not only do you have a great subject, but also you can pitch that subject past that committee. So that committee goes, do you know what? I'm kind of interested and the audience will be kind of interested in this. So like a three step approach. Then the thing was cancelled. So I spent all this time building this bloody submission. They wanted a lot of detail about what this presentation would be. I spent all this time building it and then we got zapped. Ah. Oh. So what's this presentation about? Well, this presentation is effectively this submission as a spine with some work I originally started doing on the presentation hanging off this submission spine. Some of the ideas were fleshed out quite a lot. Some of the ideas were not fleshed out much at all. To be honest, they were they sort of like a one liner and they've been left as a one liner. But I still thought it would be kind of interesting to share it. Otherwise, it's just going to go in the bin. So I spent the last day or so just adding a few more bits and bobs to this presentation. So I do want you to appreciate it is a work in progress. And in fact, it's slightly worse than that. It's TIP. It's not WIP. It's TIP. Thinking in progress. So there are some things here I haven't thought through to conclusion yet. I've just thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. That's an interesting bit of lateral thinking. And that's where the part two of this, the workshop, comes in. Because I think it may be interesting to take some of those malformed new ideas and play with them a little bit as a community and see what we come up with. So this is why I wanted to show you what I did for the submission. This was my first bit on the submission. I basically wrote it like a dialogue from a James Bond film. If you could imagine the James Bond theme playing at this moment. Large wooden panelled office in central London. So listen up 007. This assignment is your most difficult yet. This isn't end of the world super lasers or seven foot tall mute henchmen with silver teeth. Your task is to infiltrate a large multinational enterprise conglomerate and, despite its own best efforts, help it to survive, thrive and become a fit, healthy, modern, agile organisation for its own colleagues and customers. And you must do all this without exposing yourself to career-ending danger. And if you can't do it, coldly and objectively, then 008 can replace you. So can you? Now you've got to admit, that's a great hook, I reckon. You know, literally the start of a Bond film. So the idea was I was going to put change agents, 007, secret agents, mash it all together and see what comes up. First things first, I based a lot of the fundamentals on change agent in this presentation on this book. The Change Agents Handbook by David W. Hutton. It's a classic piece of literature. It's been around since the mid 90s. There we go. If you can't see it in the big version, you've got the small version here. Uh, I find it a very powerful book. Now, caveats. I treat it like a memoir, not a cookbook. And we'll talk about the difference later because there are some valuable bits in this and there are some bits that I would say are from 30 years ago. <laughs> but I still find it useful, especially for some of the key fundamentals of what a change agent is. That was the idea. I would first frame change agent, 
and being a change agent as part of this presentation. And because this is missing from most agile coaches and many scrum masters repertoires, the actual ability to be a change agent. And I had the idea that I would use loads of James Bond jokes to get across the fundamentals. Now, I must now admit to you, that's one of the things that never got done. I never got to adding the humour and the jokes and all this. But I have got loads of joke titles that I would have used. Here they are. I would have used From Waterfall With Love, uh, Casino Agile, um, Changes Forever, uh, For Your Agile Only, uh, Agile Is Not Enough, uh, Scrum Another Day, uh, The Man With The Golden Scrum, that's a particular favourite of mine, uh, Scrumable, I quite like that one as well, um, Doctor No, which is just the title of a James Bond film, but I thought, oh my God, that's so good for the negative people in work. Uh, Live and let scrum, and you only sprint twice. You only sprint twice. So, <laughs> alas, I never got to use them. <laughs> we never got that far with it. But if you can imagine those bad puns spread throughout this presentation, you would have done some good for the world of Agile. So where are we going next? Right, yeah, okay. This is Hutton's view of a change agent. So I, I took some work out of his book here. He had sort of three main areas that he said a change agent tries to do in work. Change the way they think, I people think. Change their mindset. Try and change the norms. That's how we do things around here. And the third one is changing systems and processes. I, that's how we think we do things around here. So the norms are what the workers actually do, and the systems and processes are what the system says they should do. Uh, planning, budgets, IT, supply chain, all those bits and bobs. So the idea in his mind of a change agent is someone who works in those three areas. And as you've probably spotted in your jobs, we see lots of scrum masters, and frankly, lots of agile coaches who only fall into that green box. You know, they work on the norms of the team. That's how we do things around here. And don't actually work on the overall arcing systems and processes around the teams. You know, a good person is defeated by a bad system every time. And often they don't work on the internals. Now, some of you on this call will know I have a huge bugbear about agile coaches who aren't agile and don't coach. Uh, so coaching for me is all about mindset improvement, helping people, not changing the way people think, helping people understand there are different ways of thinking and changing their own way of thinking that for me is coaching uh, organizational change is another thing and i'm afraid to say that green little circle seems to be where a lot of people in our industry are at the moment so this is basically the problem so this is from uh, a presentation i did a million years ago and the good news is i'm going to put that presentation online uh, next week so the next video after this one is going to be this six or seven year old change agent presentation. So those of you watching now will have to watch the next video to understand this video. But those of you who are not watching this video now, but are watching in the future, you can watch the next video first and then watch this video next. Glad that's all clear. No, joking aside, you don't need to watch the video. The idea is very simple. Many agile organisations only embrace agility in the team level, not in the middle management or senior level. That's been a classic problem we've had, right? Positive and negative types of change agent. Hutton would talk about change agents being visionary, being advocates, being navigators, uh, being confident, being coaches, being subject matter experts, actually, being role models, showing the right behaviour in the right way, being good servant leaders, and not being like gophers, commanders on quality, spies or progress chasers or self-promoters. Now, my worry for us in Agile is that right-hand column. There's a couple of things in there that stick straight out to me when I go into a company. The scrum masters being progress chasers, being JIRA administrators effectively, is a huge anti-pattern we see, right? Or just being a gopher running around under the team, just doing the team's menial work. There's nothing wrong with doing menial work. Servant is powerful, but it's servant leadership as well. I need to show the right behaviours in the right way. Now, this is not Agile. This is from Hutton from a good uh, decade or so before a lot of the work we've done. You see, Hutton makes an interesting distinction in his book between change agent and change agent. He talks about change agent, capital C, 
capital A, being people who are officially recognised by the company. It's a job title. It's a role. It's, a, it's something they're hired to do or put in that role by senior leadership. Right? He uses change agent with a small c and a small a to mean people who have stepped into the role, people who have discovered it for themselves, people who want to be involved in this stuff, volunteers rather than people who have it as their day-to-day -day job. Well, why should we be interested with the difference? Well, this is what Hutton was saying. He said change agency is about coaching up, not coaching or just coaching down. So it's not just going to workers on the production line to improve their quality. It's about doing educational activities with senior management, uh, assessments of statuses. Be careful of some of these, by the way, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, plans, mm -hmm. uh, organising schedules for seniors to have time to actually work on this. That You don't just want their permission, you need their direct involvement and act. Uh, play an active part in discussions, such as important things like should we allow smoking in the office? Hang on. Smoking in the bloody office? When was the last time you had smoking in the bloody off? This is the issue with this book, by the way. Some of the things are incredibly relevant for today. Some of it is a little bit out of date. You know, smoking in the office is a metaphor. I've never seen that. And I've been in this industry 25 years. You know, developing... So I think this book breaks into sort of three areas. Sort of what's a change agent? How do you go about implementing change? And how do you go about implementing quality? Because actually they're talking all about quality improvements in this book. So the quality side of thing is semi... Uh, well, should be very uh, uh, in crucial to us, but it's semi-crucial in terms of content. But how they actually plan a lot of stuff in this book is still quite traditional quite uh, waterfally in its way in terms of developing a plan and one person owning a plan so we're not going to go to that space but again it's a bit like a memoir if you read it like a memoir you can take out the bits that are useful to you and the bits that aren't if you treat it like a recipe book that you follow slavishly I'm sure you would have been a great change agent in the 1990s but we're 20 30 years later than that now and so the idea of a change agent though a good one is managing up acting as an advisor to senior bosses, challenging their preconceptions, challenging their mindset. It's not supposed to be an acquiescent role just uh, advising down. It's about working up. That's why when I talk about change, I often talk about it needs to be led by leadership. You need to have, I call them enterprise transition councils or committees, but there's a range of names for a group like that. But basically senior leadership working together with a cross-functional group across the organisational slice so it's not just senior leaders on their own. That would be quite um, uh, theoretical. So senior leaders and across functional groups, people from all over the organisation, working as a leadership change team to help change happen. Yay! Now, I want to reframe that conversation from a change agent point of view to more of a secret agent point of view. Why? Well, look back at this again. Change agent versus change agent. OK, have a look at this. Change agent versus change agent. So historically, I've done this sort of thing in organisations. So we've had like a leadership team with a cross-functional group working together with some sort of independent coaching team advising the organisation. And the reason why they're kept outside organisational line structure is if you have them in the line structure, they get squashed and squeezed and politicked out of existence. The amount of coaching teams I've seen where they've annoyed some senior boss who's just turned the tap on their money and got them all released quite quickly has been more often than I would care to admit. So I always like seeing a coaching team outside, you know, separate from the line of command, you know, separate, be, able to be independent in what they say with this transition committee leading the change, probably with some group of volunteer change army, the scrum masters, these volunteer change effort, changing organisations. Dun 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 dun, Narnia. The, 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 the ideal, the future, bugger. See, in Hutton's book, he says, sometimes it's really, really difficult to get change going when some other major forced change is in progress. So 
Can do any of you? Can any of you just off the top of your minds now? Just imagine perhaps something that could be happening in your work at the moment. Some major fundamental change to society that is changing everything at the moment and blowing everyone's minds. I I, I really can't imagine anything at all. It's, who would know? Um, have you always heard that ancient Chinese proverb: "May you live in interesting times." Well, by the way, it's not Chinese. I was looking it up today. It looks like um, Neville Chamberlain's dad probably made it up. May you live in interesting times, but bloody hell, are we living in interesting times? I've got loads of friends at the moment who have lost their roles. They've lost their jobs. Agile coaches, senior agile people helping companies, they've been fired, basically, or furloughed if they're lucky. But a lot of them were contractors and they've just been cut because the company's got big scary things on its mind in terms of covid and stuff and it's trying to survive and they don't want to think about that agile thing at the moment but here's the opportunity now could be the perfect time to think about this stuff because we're in trouble we're having to make changes quickly we're having to be desperately focused on the highest value this is where what we do for a living should really come to the fore and yet companies are using this moment to cut that stuff like it's nice to have. And that means we're ending up with this. Transformations in the bin and a very thin layer of scrum masters surviving and everyone else being culled. Senior leadership saying, I can't have got time for that. We're trying to deal with the COVID crisis. Hmm. The change agents, capital C, capital A, have gone. That means those of us who are left behind are going to have to do something with this. The secret change agents. So what's happened between me submitting that presentation to New York and actually working on that presentation has been, oh my God, a huge amount of relevancy. <laughs> you know, when before I always used to get asked about, well, they used to call it viral change. And I promise I'm not going to use that term anymore. But viral change in organisations was normally because the organisation wasn't quite moving fast enough for the coaches. And now, for me, this type of secret organisational change is crucial. OK, so here we go. So we, the, in the spine, I said, look, we're going to have to bring out things like empowerment, how we take and create empowerment and ha inside large organisations. You know, as a secret agent, how do you influence? And we're going to have to understand goodwill and spend it wisely. So one of these techniques I've been using for years, um, you may have heard it before, Nigel's Karma model. Uh, I stole this from Tony Blair. Uh, Tony Blair, I was reading his autobiography and he mentioned how prime ministers, when they get uh, elected, often have a load of goodwill or good karma with the electorate, with the press, with their own parties. They are winners. And he says many prime ministers waste that karma or that goodwill frivolously. OK, spend it on silly things and they end up with very little goodwill. And when something difficult needs to happen, they haven't got that that influence, that goodwill to make that difficult thing happen. A great example was Theresa May a couple of years ago. She had some goodwill. She had the election only scraped through a little bit. And then for the rest of her time as leader, she bounced along the bottom, desperately trying to survive. Yeah. Look at it now. Boris has got loads of goodwill, right? Not just from being ill and stuff, but I mean from his actual election win. So he, he needs to spend that goodwill wisely. Tony Blair built up goodwill for nearly a decade and then spent it very frivolously in the Iraq war. So as leaders, as influencers, you've got to be very aware of the amount of good karma you have with your wider world. Cultivate it and spend it appropriately. As a secret change agent, you probably start off with very little goodwill. Not like an a, a external consultant who's come in, who's written a book or something. You've got very little goodwill. You've got to build that goodwill up before you start spending that goodwill. But how build up through success, through influence, and then spend it wisely. The other thing Tony Blair said was about strategy versus tactics. 
Um, Tony Blair made a point that never confuse the two. <laughs> a lot of people do. The idea of strategy is you've got a long-term direction, a long-term aim and objective. Tactics are the wibbly-wobbly things you do to get there. He would say people often would confuse the two. They'll be so obsessed with their strategy, they couldn't have any give or take on their tactics. And some people are so ducky and divey, so Dell boy, as you would say. They lose sight of the prize, lose sight of the goal. As secret change agents, you may need to use tactics that are quite slippy and slidey to get change happening, but you should never take your eyes from the prize. You must understand the overall goal and the overall achievement you're trying to reach. This was the bit I'm not sure on. Right? So this was one of the things I literally just wrote Cambridge 5 and then moved on. And when I was coming back to this, I thought, how much did you know the Cambridge Five? These are Don McLean, Guy Burgess, Kim Philby, Anthony Blood, and allegedly John Carn Cross. Uh, the idea of these five were five young men at Cambridge who got uh, basically uh, turned into Russian agents and then said so the, uh, effectively became KGB agents and then spread their um, their secret agentness across the UK and across the world. Now, the story goes that they were got quite early as students and then deliberately developed a lot of their careers to put themselves in place of influence. Now, whether that's true or not, I'm going to deny everything, allegedly. Uh, but the idea is making their way to places of influence before they start instituting change. That's an interesting way to think about secret change agency, being a secret agent. Uh, how, how can I change this organisation? Can I change it from my current role? Does that mean I've got to leave? Not necessarily, but there could be an opportunity to move to a role where you have more ability to influence and change things, even if that role isn't scrum master per se, or is an agile coach per se, but it's a role that actually enables you to instigate change in that environment. Then, of course, we need to talk about things like how do we survive in a in a in a hostile company, in a hostile world, sort of literally the secret agent as a change agent. How do we do sort of bottom-up, viral, sorry for that word, change? So when I looked into this, I thought I could look into things like the Marquis, you know, from World War II. So Cambridge Five, post-World War, actually pre-World War II, but post-World War II is where they did most of their stuff. The Marquis was from World War II itself, French partisans. Uh, I think Marquis is like a Corsican word for Bush or Heath or something, something like that. But the idea of the Marquis, they were partisans who worked behind the scenes to sabotage uh, during their country's invasion. Could we do something similar? Because I thought it would be fascinating because most organisations where they call it bottom up change, for me, it's just chaotic and uncoordinated. You know, it's bottom up, but it's bottom up in like a, just a random way. And actually, you probably want to have some sort of growth and plan to bottom up change. So my idea was maybe look into the marquee. And the one thing I did look into was their um, cell model. So the idea of like these groups, like the marquee, is they wouldn't all know each other. If you did, one of you gets caught, everyone gets caught. The idea was they'd have these little cells, like here they're called Alan and Alice. And those two cells don't know each other, right? They, never, they don't even know they exist. Uh, and they have people on those cells who... But Alistair here, Alistair has got two cells he's building, Alpine and Altitude. Now, Alpine do not know Altitude and Altitude do not know Alpine. They only know each other and their local officer, Alistair. So the idea of this cell model is that if one cell gets destroyed, if alcohol, and there's always going to be alcohol, gets destroyed, the only person potentially at risk is maybe Al uh, Alidade. Or no, Alidade? Well, I don't know what that word says. Um, that's the idea. Could we do something similar with that? That was my idea. I never got further than the idea with it. But my idea was, could we do something on that, that type of model with viral change? I, we deliberately build teams that are very self-supporting, but are very independent and don't require lots cross-funding or cross-communication with other independent change teams. The idea of having these things run semi-independently internally, but working together, but not potentially being turned off all at the same time so if someone stopped the funding let's say these groups could carry on autonomously without a need for that funding oh now this is something i've done a lot of work on actually so about recruiting the right people so when we talk about organizational change capital c capital a <laughs> change agent uh, i will often say when you're trying to build a change team or something like a coaching team you want to get a mix of experience uh, i called them wildcat piranha and echidna um, the, the, the reason why I called them that is I needed words that had those red letters in. So the first one, wildcat, is I-L-T. 
Well, that means is uh, internal long term, internal long term. So what you want in any change team is some staff who have been around the block a bit, right? They know people and they know people who know people. You want a few people like that. Uh, I don't know if Jeff's still on this call, but Jeff and I, our boss and a few of our team members, they weren't really agile people per se when we were doing agile change, but they knew people, they knew the networks, they knew who to talk to. And that was so incredibly useful to get real change happening in an organization. You know, did they care that much about agile? A little bit, but most importantly, they had contacts. The next one were piranhas. I-N-H, internal new hires. That was people like me. So when I first became an Agile coach, I had been in the company five years, I think. Now, to you guys, that may sound long term, but back at British Telecom, you were positively a newbie until you were there a decade, right? And so we were all still like fresh blood, you know, you're in our mid-twenties, all young and youthful and energetic. We got Agile, oh man, this is great, this is going to change the world. A lot of enthusiasm, lots of eagerness. Some would call us zealots. I would just say we are idealists. Really powerful to have as part of your change team. People who believe in the change itself. And the echidnas, the EC, that's external consultants. There is a place for external consultants. Experts who can come from another place and give you advice, give you support. They've seen a lot of stuff. That would be really useful in terms of your own transformation, your own organisational change. So if I'm a capital C, capital A change agent, I try and build change teams or, or um uh, agile coaching teams of a blend of these experiences so we've got people with people who know people people with the energy people with the knowledge from outside so powerful to have that team here's problem number one as a secret change agent as a viral change person you don't have any of that money you can't hire these people in you've got to find the right people now this is incredibly dark <laughs> OK, I stole this off an espionage website. Um, this is how um, they say agents convert other agents or agents get you to be agents. Um, they call it mice. This is like a really dark four point model. Money, ideology, coercion or ego. So the idea is a lot of people come agents but for money. Basically, some of the most famous um, CIA spies, that I, not for the CIA, but in the CIA, basically didn't do it out of ideology. They did it for cash, cold, hard cash. Right? I read about one FBI agent last night for 25 years, money, money, money. That's why he did it, sold stuff to, to the Soviet Union. Right? Now, for us, we don't have that money, but we may have benefit. So I always like to think, how can I recruit the right people? Win, win. Let's be more constructive about it. Get away from the mercenary side. What can I do that makes it good for them and good for me? If it's good for them and good for us, we'll get them on board with these ideas. We'll get them on board with this change. Ideology. Now, again, that was the Cambridge Five, wasn't it? Their great belief in communism, why they supported the Soviet Union. Well, I, en I ended up developing a great belief in agile, which is why I became an agile coach and got really into the agile thing. A belief in the system, a faith that it works. That's another great way to get people in. Hey, you believe it too, I believe it, let's work together on this. Coercion, I'm not going there, right? That is dark. That's so dark as like blackmail and threatening people to get involved with Agile. I would never do that. However, I see many Agile organisations doing exactly that. Trying to get people involved in organisational change, becoming Agile through threats. You know, well, your, your job role's disappearing. So if you don't become a Scrum Master, yeah. or things like, well, if your team's not 90% Agile by the end of the year, you know, all this really dark stuff, sort of the stick rather than the carrot with teams. I think that's incredibly bad and would get agile in name only at the best of times. The bottom one's interesting though. Ego, or I, I use the term emotion. I, I changed ego. But he, they would say that in terms of secret agents, people often become spies because of a grudge. They've got something against someone. They've been overlooked for a promotion. They want revenge or maybe a sense of power. They say some of these uh, spies are quite minor in their job role, feeling quite low status. And being a secret agent, being a spy, gives them the secret thrill. The secret, you know, oh, I have actually, you don't understand. I'm actually of high importance here. You know, that idea of like people who are turned off work or have grudges, that's all very negative for us. But I like the idea of emotion, personal links. It's not grudges, not disaffection, not, you know, making you feel more authority, 
but maybe feeling empowerment. So maybe that E for us could be empowerment. Hey, that could be a great way to get people involved in this. Look, you feel more ownership of your work. You feel more power. You feel we're in this together. You and I are friends. These are other ways you can help bring people into this experience with no power, no influence, just a relationship, but you can bring them on board with that relationship. So trying to take this rather dark, moist concept and look at it from a positive, agile point of view. Oh, here's another one as well. Again, so that was, that was the first one was uh, recruiting the right people. Then the next one was recruiting the right people. <laughs> the third one is recruiting the right people. What do I mean by that? We're getting the right people with the right skills and roles involved. So again, if we're going to do viral change, uh, sorry, ah, that word again. If we're going to do sort of organic, bottom-up change, we're going to have to get the right people involved. Now, this list you can see on the screen is basically what those cells, those the marquee or people like that, is what they needed uh, to be able to keep running as independent cells. Like, they needed money, they needed documentation, they needed communication. And I've pulled out the five that I think we need to keep a self-organising, self-directed change going. We do need ways to communicate to each other, ways to give information to each other, ways to support each other's psychology, ways to train each other, ways to fund this. So what I would try and do if I was doing bottom-up change is try and get the right people involved in this. Do I know a friendly face in HR? Do I know a friendly face in the supply chain? Let's say I'm trying to buy training and I have to go through an official supplier who's going to take nine months to give me a course. Well, if I know the right person in supply chain, maybe they can help me not cheat the system, but you all know with these processes, there's a right way and a million wrong ways. Maybe they can help guide me the right way through the process so we could get that training earlier, get that training cheaper, get that training out of last year's budget, all those types of things. So you need to get, when you're doing viral change and trying to find people to bring on board with your change, you need to think of it not just about those who believe in it, but those people who have the right skills and roles who can help you perpetuate that change and carry it forward. Now this one I've done almost no work on at all. The idea of secret agent the smuggler. The idea I was thinking of like a secret agent being a bit like Han Solo, you know, taking information between people. Or and I looked up online, there's things like live drops. Live drops where basically a spy gives another spy a piece of information, and a dead drop is when, in fact, there's loads of dead drops over the UK. I don't know if you know this. People are gluing USB keys into walls. And the idea is you put something into it, you upload your information, and then someone else comes along, plugs their key in, and downloads the information. Now, I operate safe software. I don't plug into any dodgy USB keys anywhere myself. Far too many viruses get spread that way. But that's the idea of a dead drop. The dead drop's where you like stick a letter under a bridge, and then a certain time of day, your fellow agent comes along and pulls the letter out from under the bridge and gets the secret information. I haven't done much with this. It's an interesting idea in terms of secret agency, but I, you know, I didn't want to take it further when the presentation was stopped. And that's when we get to this one. So when I had the idea for this presentation, this was just a one liner in that pitch. How do we build communities of change, secret agent as agent provocateur? And in my mind was just an image, I, I don't even know if it's a real film, but an image of in some film, in some sort of pub, people are grumbling and along goes like a bad guy who um, basically winds the pub up to get them into a fury. I've just realised what film it is, I think. I think. Is it Beauty and the Beast? <laughs> the Disney film, where the guy goes in the pub and gets them all wound up against the beast. Is it, is it really? It, I, if it isn't, I don't know. But I was imagining a film like that, where the, like, the agent comes in and goes, ah, oh, what about that evil beast who lives in the castle? And everyone's like, ah, he's all right. No, he's not all right. He's a monster. He's got Belle. He's got Belle. Ah! That was my mental model for this bit. I thought we could do something interesting on agents, you know, stimulating change. And so just yesterday, I thought, oh, I'll fill it out a little bit. Sounds interesting. I'll fill it out a bit. And I started looking into it and I realised, oh, my God, this is not something I want to talk about on a presentation. Not in a million bloody years do I want to talk about this on a video. Right. Uh, you can only imagine the sort of things that came up when I started searching for agents. By the way, do you know what this picture's from? Terminator 2. It's Terminator 2? So what are these? What are they? Well, it's, don't say Terminators, by the way, that's obvious. But what are they What are they actually? Infiltration units. Yeah. Bots. 
So we could go a whole load of interesting dark places with this. Have you seen on... So I'm going to mention something I think's mostly safe. Covid is caused by 5G transmitters. Now, hopefully, you know that to be so ridiculously insane that it's hilariously funny and not dark or weird in any way. Just hilarious, right? But there are... I, on Twitter at this moment, right, there'll be some famous scientist giving a really good explanation about why, how viruses are not caused by radio waves. And you'll have some person in the comments will say something a bit snarky saying, well, look at this picture. Look at the spread of COVID compared to 5G or something like, mad like that. Right. And then like a thousand people will dogpile. Right. They'll all jump on and say, you're an idiot. How could you think 5G is being spread by COVID? I mean, COVID is being spread by 5G. No, damn it. That's the rumour I'm going to start. 5G mobile phones are being spread by viruses. They're, 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 the viruses are growing. The 5G. Don't do that. All I will say is, look at how much effort that troll, that bot, put into its post. Ten seconds of effort. Look how many thousands of posts replied to it. It's a very asymmetric reaction. Something small gets a big reaction out of the, the internet community. Trolling par excellence. So a lot of examples I looked into were effectively trolling to a greater or lesser extent. Um, some of them are very, I'm not going to go there, I really don't want to go there. Suffice to say, starting a fire can be quite easy. When the bush starts raging, you know, a small ignition gets a big fire going. What was I trying to communicate here? Well, for God's sake, I was trying to stay out of politics and out of legal and out of sexism and racism and nationalism and all the other isms that are on the internet. What the point I was trying to make is there will be some actions that are very asymmetric as a, a secret change agent. You can do something small and get a big effect out of it. That's where you should be focusing your actions as a change agent internally, as a secret agent. You haven't got a lot of goodwill. You haven't got a lot of money. You haven't got a lot of time. You've got to really look for those asymmetric reactions. Look for those exponential curves in small thing for big impact and see what you can do to make that actually happen. Oh, yeah, this is another one I didn't spend much time on. Change agent as network leader. The idea behind this one was if you start building up enough cells, you can start formalizing the change. <laughs> so at this point, Station Berry has got like eight or nine people working, keeping all of its potential recruits up. We've effectively built a coaching team now. It may not have been officially funded. It may not have been officially set up, but now we have an official coaching team. So sort of moving from a bottom up, a sly sneaker agent approach till eventually you can reveal yourselves <laughs> on the internet or reveal yourselves in work. Da -da! Look, we've been building up this thing behind the scenes for a long time and now we're ready to go with some good funding. Or maybe this. Now, this was something I love. You may have seen this. This is, it came out a few months ago. This is the CIA released an official document. It's been, um, uh, what's the word? Made unconfidential, whatever that is. Uh, released, uh, publicly released from archives. A document, uh, a document on simple sabotage. Because they were talking about how, you know, um, sabotage often is looked upon as being highly technical, very complex, requires detailed planning, specially trained operatives. But sabotage could... Sabotage. It came from, wasn't it, the Dutch workers through their, their wooden shoes, their sabots, into the machine, you know? Could be something very... A very simple act could, could cause great destruction as a saboteur. So what they did was put together a little leaflet on simple things normal people could do to sabotage, like, an invasion. So the country's been invaded. What could you do to fight back in your own small way? I've only, I've skimmed the document. It's hilarious. It's brilliant, right? You must read it. You must go to the link when I share the slides and have a look at it. It's great. The top five things got pulled out on the CIA website. And I love these top five things. They said, what should managers and supervisors do to hold back the enemy? Well, they should try and lower production and lower morale to get less things out of the factories. So the best way of doing this is being pleasant to inefficient people and giving them promotions and discriminate against the efficient people and complain unjustly about their work. Employees should find ways to work slowly. Use a light hammer rather than a heavy hammer. Use a small wrench rather than a large wrench. Try and be slow. Try and increase the amount of effort it requires to get anything done. As an organisation, when possible, send everything to committee. 
everything's going to be discussed in the meeting, including meetings. Get it involved in meetings. Make those committees as large as you can, as bureaucratic as you can, and more conferences when things get more dangerous. With the telephone, route people the wrong direction, make it hard to communicate, hard to connect people together. And finally, with transport, do things like double book people on trains and on flights. Make transport particularly hard to achieve so people can't get around. Hang on a minute. The CIA is recommending this as ways of sabotaging an invasion. Those five things I see in most large companies every day of my life. Don't you? It's exactly, that's just describing large company work. You know, people just people abusing the wrong people, employees doing things inefficiently, having too many meetings on meetings, communication being so difficult, bloody Jira, transport being difficult. I can't even book your own flights. So my joke is we're already sabotaging ourselves anyway. So why do this? Well, my idea with this one, could, could we do a de bono trick and sort of reverse think these? So, you know, the Edward de Bono idea of lateral thinking? Can we perhaps take these five things and reverse them and see what opportunities arise then? So rather than say, OK, how as manager and supervisors do we make sure we do not discriminate against efficient workers? How do we make sure um, that we work in an effective way? How do we make sure we have as few meetings as possible, not as many meetings as possible? How do we make sure our communication actually helps communication? The greatest thing about this lockdown is Zoom. Right? Zoom is nothing special, and that's what makes it special. It works. I can talk to you, you can talk to me. It works. I used to work for a telephone company for a decade. Most telecommunications barely work there for most of the time we were there. It just bloody works. Can your company use Zoom? Uh, transport, you know, all these things. Maybe if we reverse them, we could find a way to actually find ways of improving our organisations. We said before, what sabotage? It's small, little, simple acts that ordinary people can do. Well, if we reverse that, what small, simple acts could we do as people on the ground of a company to make it better? That's organic, ground up change. Little small acts done by people that can help make improvements, not as a coach, but as a wide organisation. It's not about the saboteur with their dark mask on. It's about the community all collectively making small, little improvements. That, I think, will be interesting to get viral change happening. Well, else? Oh, yeah. And this is where I had an idea and I never took it any further. So things like gadgets. I thought, oh, we could do an entire Bond joke on gadgets, you know, Bond's tools and tricks of the trade. And then I didn't think any more on that. If I had had more time, if I if the, if the conference was going ahead, I would have sort of deep dive the concept, the lateral thinking concept of tools or gadgets. Uh, the only thing I can think about this one is if you look in the background, you can see um, this this tool here. This is like a robotic sort of fake dog from Moonraker. Um, I think it's one of the worst gadgets ever to appear in a Bond film. Um, completely useless, over-engineered, pointless, gets in the way of the story, gets in the way of what we're trying to achieve, a.k.a. Jira. There we go. There's Jira. Everyone likes when I make a Jira joke. There is Jira given James Bond form. There we go. Over-engineered, too many features, gets in the way of a good story. Anyway. That's what I thought about gadgets. And the other thing I didn't put enough thought into was henchmen. So I had the idea about maybe we could do something, you know, Bond henchman, the villain, like, you know, not the big boss, but, you know, the, the, right, the right hand man or the right hand woman. Um, so I thought I could do something with this, maybe what's a metaphor for this, but I didn't go any further than uh, just today. I went on Twitter and tried to find out a gender neutral word for henchman. Anyway, but it was another area I wanted to explore deeper, maybe with some lateral thinking, and because the presentation never went anywhere, I never did. I've just left it open. But the final thing I thought was quite fascinating, which is James Bond, I think we can all agree, is a really rubbish secret agent. <laughs> Everyone knows who James Bond is, right? He turns up in a very fancy car, making a lot of fuss and a lot of noise. You know, he's the equivalent of like a, a terrier coming in your front door and barking and pooing on the lawn or pooing on your, your, your carpet. He's not exactly subtle in any shape or form. And again, my concern with agile coaches or change agents, a lot of them are like James Bond. Uh, high ego, 
well, white male and middle-aged like me, you know, the, the ego-driven, very front-centre, very loud, front-of-house type characters, when in fact genuine change agents, genuine secret agents are anonymous. They're the people you don't notice in the shop because that's their entire job is to be not very noticeable. They're the person who's humble, you know. They don't make a big fuss. They're humble, they're anonymous, they make behind-the-scenes stuff happen really rather effectively. Not big, loud and ego-driven. Yeah, and I include myself in this number, by the way. I will admit to being, I'm very loud and annoying. And a lot of us are very loud and annoying. And I'm not sure that's the greatest actual human model for being a secret viral bottom-up change agent. You need to be more subtle, more humble, showing more humility. I've said it before, I'll say it again, but C.S. Lewis said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And that's what a good change agent's trying to do, trying to improve the organisation. The, the man is not the movement, as they would say. The idea is the human is not the organisation. Uh, I am just one thing trying to improve this organisation. And that's why, for me, there's a risk that we think of ourselves like James Bond, but actually, we're a bit more like the villains. Two final things. This is from a slide I was given 15 years ago in BT. Um, I don't even know who John Brewer is. I tried to find out who he was today. He's been on the Agile scene for a long time, but I couldn't find much information on him. He said, villains in James Bond films never do the simplest thing that could possibly work. They always horribly over-engineer. Austin Powers even made a joke out of it, didn't they? With why don't you just shoot him, you know? Um, so my concern with what we do is, if we are a bit of those big brains with the big plans, being a bit more blow-felt than Bond, my concern is that could be reflected in how we approach change. And again, in many large organisations, I've seen change agents with some weird and wonderful, intricate approaches, right? And the trouble with those weird and wonderful, intricate approaches was... I don't know if they were having much success with them. They looked good, they sounded good, the slideware was good, but they weren't just helping improve people's lives. And that's really what being a change agent's all about, helping improve people's lives in work to improve the work. What's the simplest thing we could actually do? Now, I know Bond's a bit of a sociopath, to be honest, but he never seems to over-engineer, does he? <laughs> he always does the simplest thing that could possibly work, James Bond does, whether you like him or hate him as a character. And that's my main concern. Are we the villains? Could we sometimes be the baddie in the conversation? Be the, the very clever egomaniac with the massive plan that should work? Should being the operative term. You know, I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm just concerned about that in terms of how change agents seem to bounce out of organisations and how what we could do to work more effectively, a bit more under the surface rather than loud and proud and dangerous. Okay, there's one last thing I'd like to show you, then we're done. There's a product backlog on this. I didn't want to show it to you straight away because I didn't want to influence you. But if you are going to do something with this sort of bottom-up change, one, well, the human the UX you don't care about, but the gadgets, the henchmen, the agent provocateur, deep diving the CIA document, there is something I didn't get to, which is actually the book Viral Change, um, which is actually, again, interesting memoir some stuff in there i really don't agree with some stuff in there i found quite fascinating but it's quite interesting in terms of what we're trying to do here and more fearless change which i've got up here on the shelf if you can see it up there oh it's out of camera view annoyingly um I'll, I'll get it for you one second let's move r2d2 there we go r2 more fearless change um, these are just uh, strategies for making your ideas happen. Uh, very, uh, Linda Rising wrote it years ago. This is the updated one, which is twice as thick. There's loads of interesting patterns in there. I would have loved to have added if this presentation had gone on, basically. Um, or even John le Carre stuff. John le Carre would have been fascinating. You know, the, uh, the, the spy who came in from the cold. Tinker, Taylor, soldier, spy. I think that would have been an interesting area of investigating further. But alas, no. The one thing I'd like to show you, though, is this. This is basically the point of this presentation, right? That I did come to some conclusions, which is basically where we started is what we need to do. So, you know, I gave you that, that seemingly unconnected advice on submitting to gatherings. Well, I think the same advice applies for flourishing organic change, because we're not using the V word anymore. Flourishing organic change. A good subject. 
If you want change to happen, it has to add value to the people on the ground and not be theoretical, a real thing. There has to be a hook for them. So it's not just value add, there has to be a hook on the on the thing being added. Something to make them go, hmm. And there has to be a pitch, because you have to be able to pitch it, uh, not just necessarily to the workers themselves, but to the associated bosses, people around them, the committees that involve them. So a good subject, good hook, good pitch. Those are the three things I would basically try and make sure every single small, organic, flourishing change I was trying to make would fit into that model. So there was a point of talking about the uh, advice at the start after all. Well, that's that one done. You notice I've turned the lights back up? I haven't really. This I actually filmed before I did the presentation. Anyway, could you please share, as always, on all forms of media you can imagine, likes, retweets, shares on LinkedIn, anything like that at all, any medium, anything to help get this message out to further audiences. I would like that, and I think they would too. Thank you, anyway. I hope you enjoyed it. It's been hellish fun putting this thing together, and I'll see you again soon. Take care, and goodbye. Next episode... Optimus Prime, Change Agent.